Thank you so much for joining me for this De Morgan Foundation talk. Kick the Queen, Evelyn de Morgan's use of the crown as a symbol in her paintings. Um, so today we're going to look at a range of paintings by the late Victorian, early Edwardian artist Evelyn de Morgan, who created a breadth of, uh, of pictures that deal with a range of different subjects. But something that I'd noticed recently, whilst we've been thinking uh, a lot about monarchy on the event of the Platinum Jubilee last weekend, is um, one symbol in particular that de Morgan focuses on quite a lot is the crown and she uses the crown in a number of her paintings um, throughout her career which spanned from about 1873 to her death in 1919 and so we're going to have a look at what is meant by this how and why she used uh, the symbol of the crown in her paintings and how we can better understand her views on some issues or uh, uh, some, some things that she engaged with, such as her spiritualism, her wealth uh, and materialism, her own wealth and materialism, and um, indeed her views on that, and her socialism as well. So quite a lot to get through today. Uh, so I hope you're sitting comfortably and you've got a cup of tea. So Evelyn de Morgan um, was born into an upper middle class household in London. Her parents were Anna Maria Spencer Stanhope of Cannon Hall in Yorkshire and Percival Pickering QC. So her father was part of Queen's Council and her mother came from the landed gentry. They were a well off family um, who had moved to London and, uh, and raised their four children there, um, Evelyn and her two brothers and her sister. Wilhelmina Sterling. They had a very comfortable home life and childhood. Uh, I think for Evelyn de Morgan, um, being the sister of two brothers meant that she was um, able uh, to attend the lessons that his, her parents had bought for him anyway. Uh, so she had a really well-rounded education in uh, a range of you know, the classics and in mathematics and sciences. So a very intelligent child. Balanced with this was um, theo theology and uh, study of Christianity. Her family were devout Christian, Christians and attended church. And in fact, after um, Evelyn had been born, some months uh, later after her birth, they traveled up to her mother's family home in Yorkshire to have her baptized. And for a long time, she didn't have a name. Um, she was just sort of a baby girl Pickering uh, until that, the baptism when she was baptized, Mary Evelyn Pickering. Um, she once commented as a child, um, of course I know that God exists, he made heaven and earth, but where did he sit when he made them? So this starts to give you an, you know, she had a real understanding of the universe around her and um, was sort of grappling with these enormous ideas of, uh, of heaven and earth and um, through her Christian study as well I think this gave her quite a, uh, an accepting and open view uh, and belief system. She sort of with her Christianity um, I certainly think that she was very uh, accepting and understanding um, of the idea of the afterlife um, and a poem that she wrote when she was a little bit older than she is in this photograph is a beautiful one called the angel of death and I'll just read two stanzas to you now through the sun sky breaks a glad light gleams over the hills a half of light and a spirit is descending love life and peace gently blending so we've got these ideas here that um, the spirits can enter our own world and indeed our spirits can enter another realm uh, beyond uh, the death of the body and it was this that attracted her to spiritualism a little bit later in her life as we shall see But one painting in particular, I think, captures some of the ideas um, that uh, that she had from a young age about religion and her sort of place in the world as um, as an upper class uh, person, even though she was a child at that point, uh, is this painting Earthbound, which was created in 1897, so about halfway through her career. The art historian Judy Oberhausen describes a worldly man who possesses all the accoutrements of wealth and power, yet is portrayed as somehow morally bankrupt. And indeed, there we see a very wealthy man in a beautiful gold shining robe with coins that make up the pattern uh, there. So obsessed with his own wealth that he hasn't noticed the angel of death approaching him, or indeed spirits of the departed who are spiritually engaged, flying off into, uh, into the spirit realm. 
what I think is particularly interesting about um, this painting is that it it almost visualizes uh, another poem or a story this time that De Morgan wrote again as a young as a young child, a young adult. Then she was about 13 years old. Um, she wrote her own play, which was entitled The Love of Money is the Root of All Evil, a Tragedy in Five Acts. Sadly, she never finished the project. She only got about halfway through Act One in the notebook that it's written down in, in her own handwriting. But what Act One does is set the scene of a lonely count at the end of his years sitting in a castle. Near the front of, she says, near, sitting near the front of the stage, he is an old shriveled man whose hair and beard are white and tangled. And this description, I think, really matches the miser that we see in Earthbound. Um, the count in the story is sort of lamenting that his daughter is going to marry someone as poor as a church mouse rather than pursuing um, a life of wealth. So we see in this play and in the later painting that De Morgan's really grappling, grappling with what's important. Is it material wealth? Or is it a spiritual happiness that can only be found once someone looks beyond that wealth? And uh, of course, with the theme that we're talking about today, it won't have escaped anyone's attention that um, the chap we see here has a crown on his head. So in the story, he was a count and in um, this painting, he can be read as a king. Uh, and so this idea that, uh, you know, the kingship and the power with that um, comes this, this sort of material wealth. And the idea is that that shouldn't blindside someone from their own spirituality as well. If you look very closely at the image on the screen, you'll see the crown that he wears is um, one that has a serpent curled up on top of it. So a, a brilliant detail. And um, with all of De Morgan's paintings, you know, it's worth looking for those tiny details that she puts into them and in this serpent I think she's giving us a hint of hope yes he might be obsessed with his material wealth now and even though he's right at the end of his life on the cliff edge before he falls into the waters of Elysium actually there's still hope that just as the snake transforms and sheds its skin this man could still change his ways and look up and, uh, and become involved in um, in spirituality and really get into that, that very Christian way of uh, worshipping um, in order to access his own spirituality. So I think that's a lovely uh, painting to start with, painting from mid-career and uh, a play from um, De Morgan's early childhood and, uh, and think about how she was engaging in some of these big ideas um, from a very, very early age. Here we see her at the age of about 20. And um, I think it's fair to say that about this time, we see that even though she's been grappling with her position as sort of Orthodox Christian and as wealthy middle-class woman that she was growing up to be, she was actually quite uncomfortable um, with, with certainly the wealth uh, and the class side of, um, side of her upbringing. She'd been born into privilege, but remember she turned her back on the res uh, respectful um, um, uh, and, um, and sort of social order that she was uh, that was associated with her position and um, decided instead to devote herself to the bohemian art world. This was absolutely uh, against her, her, her mother's wishes, certainly, who once said that she wanted an, uh, a daughter, not an artist. So the idea being there that um, having a daughter who would be presented at court as a debutante was a very different lifestyle to that of artist, um, which at the time was very much considered sort of a, a seedier, less reliable, not very respectable uh, career to have. And when her mother did threaten to, to take her to court to be presented as a debutante, that's when we get this wonderful quote um, from de Morgan, if I go, I'll kick the queen. Um, and so in this quote, she's really not having any animosity towards uh, Queen Victoria personally, I don't think, but more about the place of uh, status and class and, and what that means for people in society, in the modern world that she's growing up in. Um, I think she really does take umbrage with um, the, the fact that wealth can be inherited and yet it's still seen as something good and something better than being born into poverty, even though for the people born into these situations, they have no control over that. Um, and for her herself to be born into privilege, I think she was always very aware of that. And um, through her artwork, tried to sort of rationalize her, her ideas about it and, um, and, and sort of come to a resolution as to her own place in society and what her own uh, ideals were. 
around the same time as we've just seen to Morgan in the photograph of her, um, she was uh, achieved so much really for a young 20 year old. And um, by this time she'd already traveled independent through France and Italy. And one of the places she visited was uh, the lower church at Assisi, um, as well as places in Rome and Perugia. And whilst at Assisi, um, she was inspired by the Master Giotto's amazing ceiling paintings, which cover the interior of these churches. And one image in particular that seems to have really resonated with a young Evelyn to Morgan was that of St. Francis marrying holy poverty. So St. Francis um, was uh, an Italian Catholic friar, deacon and mystic, and he founded the Order of Francis Minor, the Order of St. Clair and the Order of St. Francis. Um, so a really influential figure um, who's venerated, uh, was one of the most venerated in Christianity, and it was Pope Gregory IX that canonised Francis on the 16th of July, 1228. Um, he's most well known, I think, in the literature for taking on the stigmata, so the marks of Christ being crucified but the reason for that is always thought to be through his own uh, rejection of his material wealth he was born wealthy and he gave all of his uh, his worldly possessions away in order to feel closer to Christ and so the Giotto image of him literally getting married to poverty under Christ's blessing we see Christ with the sign of the benediction behind them sort of sealed the deal so really he's giving himself wholly over to uh, the, a life of, of holy poverty uh, in order to get closer to Christ. And that's what we see in um, this Giotto image. And this painting by Evelyn de Morgan from 1896 directly references um, that Giotto painting. It's the only painting um, known to me, certainly, and I, I really do think it is the only painting of hers that directly references another artwork in this way. So it was obviously of some significance and importance to her. Um, we, it's a really complex image and I'm going to go through some of the picture planes and imagery in it, uh, but we'll spend a little bit of time looking at this painting together. Um, it's a painting with multiple picture planes and that means a painting within a painting. So we have three unique spaces when we look at this picture. We have our world, the real world of the viewer. We have the world of the woman in the white dress in the middle. And then a third space, which is this historic space or this sacred space where St. Francis is undertaking the act of holy poverty. And de Morgan's used some clever pictorial um, uh, details to blur the lines between those and show us that if we act in a certain way, perhaps we could access that sacred space. So you'll notice in her reality, the woman has a yucca plant uh, on a bookshelf, but actually that merges with the brambles that are so evident in um, the Giotto original in order to me make it seem palpable that there is that link between them. You'll also notice it's actually uh, created as a tapestry in the de Morgan painting, um, rather than a fresco as it is for Giotto, but you'll notice that it's beautifully framed down this side here with a pattern of birds and fish. And um, when you see this painting in real life, it is framed with um, a very similar frame. So it's almost as though we could take place of the woman and see her painting as she's seeing that tapestry. So lots of these blurred lines between um, the picture spaces. But what we have here that de Morgan's showing us is a wealthy woman, first of all, that's the first thing we know about, notice about her in this opulent interior, but she appears frozen in a moment of uncertainty. There's a great stillness and quietness to this painting when we look at it. Um, and what she's done is whichever interior she's in, she's noticed this tapestry. And um, we see there that the, the figure of holy poverty has almost caught her eye. And what this has caused her to do is pull at the gold and pearl chain on her neck and hover her hand over this crown that's next to her. Um, Elise Lawton Smith, the art historian, uh, pays attention to this picture and um, she makes a lovely point about it, that this woman is caught between two realms, the material and the spiritual, and she picks out the mermaids on the bookcase as being uh, mirroring that as they're caught between the land and the sea. Um, so again, we've got these very clear, distinct spaces, and we're wondering what's going on between the figures within them. Um, so a really complex picture, but 
other clues in the painting start to give us a clue as to who this woman might be, not as a person necessarily, but certainly the person she's representative of or the, the type of person she's representative of. If you look uh, at the doorway she stands in front of, look very close and you'll see there's a lunette or this arch shape and inside that um, for any Harry Potter fans I always think it looks like a golden snitch uh, but it's a winged orb and um, that is an ancient Egypt Egyptian emblem of divinity and royalty uh, and she's also decorated with peacocks around her which represent eternity and the everlasting power of monarchy. I also think it's worth at this point showing uh, this picture by Sir George Hayter of Queen Victoria painted on her coronation. She's dressed in a fine silk gown decorated with embroidery, red feathers and opals. That's our woman in the picture. And I think we can see that the cape, white gown and the gold braid tied around her waist really do draw quite distinct aesthetic parallels with this coronation dress worn by Queen Victoria. And Really, I think in De Morgan's painting, the pearls that she adds there add for, stand for sort of pearls of wisdom and the opals for hope, which sort of shows De Morgan's belief that this woman can move away from her position of granted privilege back towards um, someone like St. Francis, who actually rejected all of that in favour of a purer uh, spirituality. So I think in this picture, the crown of glory, de Morgan's really questioning that divine right of kings. Why should someone be born into privilege and power and be able to secure that and, um, and have that uh, for, for themselves, especially in the modern world um, that Morgan lived in, which was one of, of great parity between um, uh, the classes, sorry, great sort of separation between the, the classes. Uh, and uh, I think she thought the position that you're born in maybe should be earned, worked for, or there should be more uh, freedom around that um, than there necessarily was in her day. The woman we see in De Morgan's painting, I think has great uh, visual similarities with um, William Holman Hunt's The Light of the World on the left and The Awakening Conscience on the right. This idea of a Christian um, image uh, reawakening something of a moral consciousness in the Victorian middle classes. There was a great feeling of a waning um, uh, interest in religion uh, during this time. And I think de Morgan's painting and Holman Hunt's painting really call on their peers, i.e. the middle classes who would have been looking at these pictures in art galleries, to reassess what their own Christian values were, what their moral code was, and think a little bit more about how they might help others. So in, um, in the Holman Hunt um, uh, pictures, um, we have the very famous Light of the World on the left, painted between 1851 and 1853, and the Awakening Co Consciousness, 1853, on the right. And these were both displayed together in 1854 at the Royal Academy ex 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 Exhibition. Thank you, pardon. So the light of the world on the left drew inspiration from the book of Revelation 320. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will patiently be waiting to be allowed in and to bring the wisdom and hope of his light to the inhabitants. It was such an important painting that the third version was completed in 1904. It went on a tour across the world as far as New Zealand, uh, and now it's in St Paul's Cathedral in perpetuity. So really a call on people to open their doors and let Christ in. And in its pendant picture, The Awakening Conscience, we see just that. Um, we have uh, a kept woman um, who is uh, clearly having an affair with this middle class man in his um, sort of secret home away from his family home away from his wife, um, which was based on an interior in St John's Wood so very recognisable to the middle classes who will have been viewing this painting as a fashionable and wealthy interior. Um, and what we see is the, the woman there rising up with this horror in her eyes. John Ruskin described this painting as her having some sort of very physical reaction to hearing the knock of Christ. And suddenly she rises up and looks out of the window ahead of her as though to change her ways and really um, start living in a morally good way. And uh, I think when we see um, de Morgan's painting, we see that uh, there are actually phoenixes on top of the 
staircase behind her, which hints that if she turns away from her life of wealth, turns towards St. Francis, she can climb up those stairs and be transformed just as the phoenixes were um, at, uh, at the top of the staircase there. So something else that I think is quite interesting about this painting is um, the person who bought it. And it actually first belonged to a man called William Imry. Now he's documented as being a very private man, um, noted for his quiet and unobtrusive life in Liverpool with his wife and his adopted daughter, Amy Elizabeth Pollard. So he's a typical wealthy Victorian philanthropist, but there was a lot of anonymity that surrounded his charity. So he was a charitable giver, um, but kept a lot of that private. Um, the number of local charities in Liverpool he supported were Herbert Lee Jackson Jones's Food and Betterment Association and organisations uh, associated with St Margaret's Church on Princess Road in Liverpool. His benevolence continued well after his death um, as his will uh, outlined funds to be given to um, benefit the Liverpool Poor Clerks, Liverpool Medical Charities and the Liverpool Cathedral Committee. So his generosity really did favour the church and organisations which addressed poverty. So the imagery in this painting, I think um, if it wasn't made between De Morgan and her patron, you can certainly see why this imagery might have appealed to him. There's also a possibility that uh, it was really a well of painting by his daughter, Amy, who I mentioned. She inherited his £260,000 then fortune uh, upon his death. And um, she may have had some steer in either selecting this painting or the, um, or the organisations her father supported. Uh, she used her vast wealth to establish St Mary of the Angels Roman Catholic Church in Everton, Liverpool, um, and that was following her own conversion to Catholicism, and she eventually became Mother Superior of the Francescan Order and of the Poor Clares, and set up a number of convents in Liverpool, Formby and um, Cornwall. So I think it really is interesting that um, this painting belonged to a family of people who'd almost undergone a St Francis-like uh, transformation from very wealthy, particularly in the case of Amy Imry, to someone who had given up her wealth uh, and renounced that in favour of, um, of her faith and religion. So it's interesting that you know, it could almost be a painting of Amy Imry. Around the same time that Evelyn de Morgan first saw that vast Giotto ceiling at um, the lower church at Assisi and had that first experience of seeing uh, such a wonderful um, uh, example of, uh, of that fresco style artwork that so inspired her, but also probably felt closer to St Francis um, due to being in, uh, in the, you know, the place that he was from and, uh, and that he was born. She was making a sketchbook and notebook and we see that on the left of the screen now. It's now in the collection of uh, Whittock Manor in Wolverhampton. And it's a fantastic resource because it has written into Morgan's own hand, I should add, an incredibly illegible hand. It's taken me such a long time to try and transcribe what she'd written down on here. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we ended up with a reading list and two books that she was reading whilst um, she was visiting uh, Assisi and, and, like I said, making sketches of and first witnessing that vast ceiling um, are noted down in this book. It's from the same year, it's from 1875. And you can see that the first one here, uh, Rocks Ahead, The Warnings of Cassandra by W.R. Gregg, uh, and that's this book here. Um, and then somewhere else, I don't know if that's on the screen, like they're writing so hard to read. But anyway, she also read a book called The Crown of Wild Olive by the art critic and social critic, John Ruskin, who's pictured there on um, the right hand side. So I would like to think maybe it was the title, The Crown of Wild Olive that inspired her title, The Crown of Glory, because these two, uh, the, the painting and Ruskin's book, do pick up on some of the same uh, issues. And both Greg and Ruskin, as social critics, really took issue with how the middle classes in particular were interpreting Christian faith in the late Victorian period. I've already mentioned it was a time of um, sort of the polarization of the classes, the poor becoming poorer and the rich becoming more wealthy under industrialism, this sort of burgeoning upper middle class of uh, merchants and, um, and business owners. 
But what Ruskin and Greg said that the sort of the impact of this had been um, on society wasn't just that they'd lost sight of religion, but they were using it in their favour. And they both particularly took issue with the Christian um, teaching or Christ, uh, or you know, sort of what's written in the Bible that. Um, uh, sort of uh, the, the poor will inherit the earth and they really saw the middle classes as using this as a reason to ignore the state of poverty uh, with the thought in their minds that actually being poor is holy being poor is just because eventually they will inherit the kingdom of heaven so rather than seeking to use their wealth to do good on earth the wealthy were keeping it with them just like the miser that we saw in earthbound clutching those coins at the end of the rock instead of being more open and uh, open-minded and looking to the world around them and seeing the need to help reform um, some uh, some of the, the poorest people in uh, in society and perhaps making a heaven on earth instead of waiting for eventual salvation um, for the poorest people around them. And there's a brilliant quote in um, Ruskin's Crown of Wild Olives where he's sort of really having a go at the middle classes for this. And he says, quote, the Bible tells you to dress plainly and you are mad for finery. The Bible tells you to have pity on the poor and you crush them under your carriage wheels. So damning words there um, from Ruskin. And he, he gave that lecture and a lot of working men's clubs and, uh, and, and wrote it in publication so that his views could be shared widely amongst uh, all the classes and with his aim to prevent further kind of moral decline. Greg's Rocks Ahead or the Warnings of Cassandra published in 1875 was also read by De Morgan and this is quite a Marxist critique of the place of religion under the capitalist regime where it has become, he says, a potent ally to the governing richly endowed classes of earth and so in parallel with what Ruskin was saying, Greg suggests that the wealthy, having secured their own riches, disenfranchise the poor further with the promise of heavenly salvation in, in return for their wretched, he says, position on earth. And I think um, what these critics were saying really resonated with De Morgan and it absolutely comes through in a lot of the paintings she makes that feature these crowns. So in this way, I think the crowns um, help us to align what her thoughts and feelings on materialism and socialism were. So in her painting, Blindness and Cupidity Chase Joy from the City of 1897, we have the figure of cupidity here, meaning so of someone who chases material greed in favour of, um, uh, of, of any sort of joy or happiness. So this real greedy figure here, like I said, wearing a crown. So it's at this point we see that um, the crown doesn't necessarily just refer to kings and queens, but anyone who's inherited this wealth, like old money um, and their real blindness to the world around them. And here we have that blindness as this figure in the middle, dressed very plainly, head swaddled in a scarf with sort of these sandals on looks very different to cupidity and does almost embody the figure of poverty and here we have poor joy who's being chased from the city walls by this uh, sort of um really um uh, I think De Morgan thinks, uh, unjust system. And if you notice, there's actually, these figures are shackled together. So it's as though the rich and the poor only exist um, in, in that sort of harmony um, where, where one is necessary to keep the other in its place. And, um, and that was something else that Ruskin picked up on in, uh, in another one of his volumes. He's, he talks very much about how um, the, the wealthy really do take advantage of the poor, um, run them down at their work, cheap labor. Uh, and that's very similar to um, works, of course, of William Morris and his socialism, who was also known to De Morgan, who uh, very much talk, calls for a socialist revolution and for the workers to be free from these shackles that keep them absolutely chained to the wealthy and in this system of uh, unjust oppression, really. Another way that De Morgan uses a crown um, is uh, also has this sort of industrial hint to it, which is quite an interesting picture to unpack slightly. Um, so the Garden of Opportunity of 1892, we have on this side the figure of wisdom and on this side the figure of folly. And in the middle, we have two foolish merchant men who have turned their back on wisdom and instead are turning to folly. And the idea, of course, is that they'll follow along over this bridge and there, if you look closely, is a devil waiting to catch them. Um, so to Morgan saying here, do not turn your back on uh, wisdom. 
uh, in favour of folly. Seems quite simple, but her symbolism for wisdom is incredibly rich and detailed and varied. We have the church at this side, but in this case, she's married the church and industrialism under the idea of wisdom as something quite good. Other motifs um, sort of uh, reinforce this. We've got the wise owl on the bench and the cornucopia that's full and blooming and, and brimming over in a world where the church and industry sit side by side and are considered wisdom, learned knowledge. However, what's on the floor and what's been discarded by wisdom is once again these earthly wealth uh, and material symbols and they include a crown. So I think in this instance um, the, the message is, is sort of clear and, and kind of fits in with what we're saying is that if you ignore what's inherited and instead focus on your own actions and your own capacity to make change then that is possible but by just wearing the crown uh, and not having any uh, agency in that and not thinking to change anything then the world um, will sort of fall away to folly so it's an interesting painting of de Morgan's to fit into some of her discussions about um, materialism and about socialism which until I started looking for that symbol of the crown across her paintings I hadn't thought of it as one that actually uh, that, that that does that I'd only ever really thought about it being um sort of the the individual's own turn to folly rather than perhaps looking at these two figures in the middle as representing society as a whole which uh, I absolutely think um it does do this painting the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force uh, has two crowns in it um so uh, you might have to look carefully but we've got the central figure here who's wearing a golden crown very similar to the crowns we've just seen in the garden of opportunity and on the head of our figure of cupidity but if you look further up the picture here you'll see a second figure with a second crown but she is wearing the crown of thorns of course from the time of christ's crucifixion um, and I think this is an excellent picture to consider what those two motifs of two very different crowns might have meant for de Morgan. And to my mind, it really shows how she blended Christian and spiritualist thinking in her own practice, but also imagery in her paintings to support that. So de Morgan's Christian mode of thinking and engagement with the material and the spiritual world seemed to have been a committed one. She was a regular attender of church, uh, to church with her father in her adolescence and into her adulthood. And I think that her, um, her upbringing, which we saw at the start, uh, really allowed her to engage with uh, the sort of feeling at the turn of the 19th century that some critics have dubbed the Victorian crisis of faith. And we saw that with Roskin and Gregg as well, this kind of questioning of what it meant to have either a spiritual belief or to uh, employ Christianity into your life and, and how people acted around that. A critic, William Michael Rossetti, brother of the pre-Raphaelite artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti, that I think many of you will have heard of, was another uh, critic of the time. And he saw religion as, quote, more a matter of conduct and of the inner life than a thing, of express than a thing expressible in a formula or proposition. So it seems here that um, I think for William Michael Rossetti, he was saying that if it's something you have as a true belief, that's far better than anything that's part of sort of the ritual and ceremony of religion. And it was thinkers like this who were some, among some of the first in this country to really accept spiritualism. So spiritualism is the belief that the human soul outlives the human body and can be contacted by the living after the death of uh, the spirit or soul in question. It again traction in the 1950s in America as an option which sought empirical proof for the heavenly realm. And through spirit rapping, so spirits knocking out messages and through um, seances, it became very popular. And the Rossettis, for example, experimented with seances regularly a lot through um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti trying to contact his departed wife, the artist Elizabeth Siddle, um, and uh, Georgina Houghton, another artist, developed skills as a medium after attending a seance. Evelyn de Morgan was really introduced to spiritualism through her marriage to her husband, William de Morgan. 
when he was growing up in his teenage years, his parents, Sophia de Morgan and Augustus de Morgan, lived with a spiritualist medium for six years. She lived in their home with them. And William de Morgan was still at home at that time. He was at school. And his mother, Sophia, kept a journal of all the goings on around having a spiritualist medium in the home with them. And she published that in a book called From Matter to Spirit in 1862. So this obviously sort of really appealed to Evelyn and it's not documented, but I think she must have got on quite well with William de Morgan's mother and that, that really introduced her to the possibilities of spiritualism. I think lots of critics of de Morgan's work, and I mean critics in the sense of people who comment on them, not those who are uh, negatively critical of them, see her work as these uh, great um, expressions of this newfound spirituality. But for me, um, I think what it did was just reinforce uh, the, the bits of Christianity that she liked. The fact that you had to do away with materialism to access and be closer to heaven. We know that de Morgan was very charitable, giving lots of her paintings to charity, particularly leaving a collection of her artworks um, for the benefit of a charity called St Dunstan's Hospital for Blinded Soldiers. Um, and also, I think, uh, actually, if you look very closely at her painting, she uses that Christian and uh, spiritualist imagery side by side. And I think from this, we can read that actually she was one of the people who um, didn't see spiritualism as an alternative to Christianity in the late 19th century but actually she was very comfortable in viewing these as complementary belief systems almost like the spiritualism was empirical evidence for the proof of a heavenly realm or something that exists beyond our lives here on earth. Um, one uh, a commenter on de Morgan's artwork has said that um, she suffered a disillusionment with Christianity. But I think in this painting, when we see the crown of thorns uh, as a key symbol, we have to accept that actually she probably was one of the people that the Reverend Dr. Ayla Le Payne has said saw the two, Christianity and spiritualism, as complementary belief systems, rather than having a sort of a great chasm between them. Now, to my mind, um, sort of to understand this painting properly, and I will get onto an explanation of it shortly, um, we have to understand the art historical references that de Morgan's making. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure there won't be in yours, that this painting is absolutely based on um, imagery of the ascension. So Christ rising up into heaven after his resurrection, after the Easter period. So if you know the Easter story of Christ um, being crucified on the third day, he was risen. And then depending on which um, chapter of the Bible you look at and read, he eventually ascended uh, to sit on the right hand of the father and here we see this upward spiral of figures from a craggy green blue gray bottom to this beautiful um, sort of uh, image uh, of the heavenly realm made through rainbow swirls and all these angels spiraling off uh, into this sort of heavenly realm at the top of the picture. Um, so clearly, uh, aesthetically, it reflects uh, ascension imagery. And some of those images I wanted to um, show with you, which are well established in the art historical canon, um, uh, are in particular um, this picture by Jura. I think this is a really notable one um, because it picks up from what happened in sort of the medieval period uh, from about the ninth century onwards when um, <laughs> the sort of Romanesque and Anglo-Saxon artists had depictions of the ascension which perhaps look quite comical to us today but it was either a hand of God coming down and sort of plucking Christ up out of the sky or these um, feet dangling down from the top of the picture as Christ was being lifted up um, to the heavenly realm. Um, but this Jura print, as so many of Jura prints were, really popular again in the Victorian period. So I wonder if this was uh, an image that, um, that de Morgan was aware of, these disappearing feet. And I think it's also incredibly important to our discussion today to show the example of um, the ascension by Giotto from the Scrovengeri. I think, chapel, um, which is in Padua, and it's another place that de Morgan visited on her 1875 trip to Italy. And here we have uh, this choir of angels and the communion of saints down at the bottom there, all looking at this figure of Christ rising up above them to uh, the heavenly realm. So a very clear um, uh, 
comparisons here with um, that uh, that De Morgan painting that we loved at that we looked at. Um, and here's a, a shot of the interior. So you can see how overwhelming it must have been to see all these wall paintings in place in uh, a building the same shape uh, as that ascension, which of course is what churches are supposed to do, to point to heaven, raise those spirits up. And as your eyes taken up through um, these marvelous paintings across uh, the inside of the uh, of the chapel there, um, then um, then we can see that uh, that would have been some truly inspirational painting. Thirdly, uh, I'd like to introduce a painting by Peter Paul Rubens, which is from the Banqueting House ceiling. And um, I really think that actually this is important for our discussions today as well, as what we have in this Rubens painting is, um, it was made for Charles II, and it shows here three distinct um, sort of ascension uh, typed images. The first one is the Union of Crowns, where we have the goddess Minerva bringing together the two crowns of England and Scotland of the young Charles, who probably represents Great Britain. And then the peaceful reign, reign of James I, so father of Charles I, we have this biblical style setting uh, that um, suggests these figures surrounded by abundance and wisdom. And then we have the apotheosis of James I, believing that the king was directly answerable to God um, and we have the wings of the huge eagle there taking him up to the heavenly realms that's across these three pieces in the middle um, and I think the fact that this was commissioned by Charles I in 1629 as a painting which absolutely celebrates the divine right of kings the lineage the coming together of two crowns and God speaking directly to Charles um, the first father uh, Really, there's a, an irony in it and that it would have been one of the last images that Charles I would have seen as he was being um, taken off to uh, his own execution. Um, so really, you know, it's <laughs> absolutely that's that's what overthrew uh, the divine right of kings um, and led to the overturning of the monarchy. But interesting, therefore, that this relied on that same ascension uh, form of painting this idea that these swirling figures could take someone up to the heavenly realm and uh, bridge that gap between heaven and earth was used in such a way um i just thought it was quite a funny one to add really so here we go we come back to the kingdom of heaven and like i said we we really get a sense of what uh, de morgan's trying to um trying to say in this picture here we've got an ascension towards heaven and in order to do that the sort of the damned here the earthly people people like us uh, here in our reality are chained to the earthly realm and only through the death of the body the removal of the gold crown becoming seeing so taking off a blindfold which this figure here is uh, is wearing removing those shackles can we reach the heavenly realm or get closer to our spiritual destiny and i think it's very important for us to note that it's not a gold crown that will get you there but a humble crown of thorns something that was worn by christ himself as he went through the horrific uh, crucifixion um, in order to uh, be true to the word of god and that's what de morgan's saying here is that this spirituality any belief that you have in the ascension of the human soul can absolutely align with your christian faith and actually it's through action like charitable giving that will get rid of your gold crown and give you this uh, crown of thorns like Christ and only then can you ascend to the realm of heaven this heavenly realm Another source of inspiration, I think, for de Morgan's painting was possibly Sandro Botticelli's The Mystic Nativity of around 1500, and that's in the National Gallery's collection. Here we see uh, the nativity scenes. We've got an infant child there reaching up towards the Virgin Mary in this stable. Um, and uh, there's a Greek inscription on it which mentions the troubles of Italy, which reference an invasion of the French who took Naples in 1494. Um, so the unrest that's going on there um, really has uh, uh, it was a period of upheaval and the picture um, picks up on this idea that uh, the world was going to end and only Christ's return would the devil be buried and the devil is indeed being buried down here at the bottom of the picture as we have a heavenly realm up at the top uh, of the painting here and so in that way it's very similar to this sort of 
demonic, quite terrifying um, action at the bottom of De Morgan's painting versus this beautiful, heavenly, more calm realm of music and joy at the top of her picture there. Now, I said I'd only recently started looking at de Morgan's crowns and her queens as well, and that was on the event of the Platinum Jubilee. It's always nice to be thematic, um, but that's actually really helped me to understand one of de Morgan's pictures. It's the final one I'll talk about today, Queen Eleanor and Fair Rosamond. Um, in it, we have the wife of Henry II, um, who has come in through a maze and discovered the king's mistress, Rosamond, here on the right-hand side. And what she has in her hand is uh, a vial of poison. So her intentions are to kill um, the innocent Rosamond there. And I think I've always struggled with understanding this in De Morgan's own um, oath because it's two women and she was such a feminist artist that I think, well, why would she want to show this scene of animosity between two women, which be, has been caused by a man that isn't even in the picture. He's not even there held accountable. This having these affairs um, but actually looking at what de Morgan thought about um, absolute monarchy has really helped me to engage with them um, with this picture so some of my previous thoughts on it were that it was de Morgan picking up on uh, uh, British or English legends and history as so many of her male counterparts did in their artwork so Queen Eleanor was an absolute favoured um, uh, painting or image by Burne Jones and he tackled it several times in the 1860s this is one version which is in Tate Britain um, and he has Rosamond there in white in other versions she's in red so I think this helps us understand how the artists were trying to pin the blame on either of these two women for the affair and for the eventual murder of, um, of Rosamond by Eleanor. In this sense, of course, she's wearing white, which suggests that she's completely innocent. And um, I also wanted to look at William Morris's La Belle is Yet, um, uh, which is a scene from the Mort d'Arthur um, of Thomas Mallory that reminds us that the Queen had always had a little dog with her and that Sir Tristan first gave her um, her, her, her first ever uh, dog that um, she had when she was in Cornwall. And um, there are lots of symbols in this that talk about uh, the, the Queen and what her position was in, um, in the story. Uh, so it's lovely to see an actual uh, an oil painting by William Morris. It's the only known one. But I think that the Evelyn de Morgan painting goes further than this. Um, and I think what we've learned today can help us unpick that a little bit. Uh, whilst we do have Queen Eleanor, of course, on the left and Rosamond on the right, actually, if we look at the color of the robes, Rosamond's wearing red for love, lust, and danger. Maybe this is um, those who haven't had monarchy bestowed on them. We have Queen Eleanor, um, who's, you know, under the divine right of kings is born or inherited um, this wealth. And particularly through her marriage to King Henry, um, she, she has sort of inherited the earth and are surrounding her with these evil demons. So maybe it's de Morgan unpicking a bit more about the, um, the evilness of the monarchy and the innocence of those it affects rather than her picking up on the story of two women um, and, uh, and, and which one of those is innocent and guilty. And I think that really does deepen our understanding of this picture as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this sort of slightly alternative um, interpretation of what we should be celebrating under the Platinum Jubilee. And I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about the symbolism of the crown in Evelyn de Morgan's artworks. Thank you very much. <laughs>